All right, so this week we're going to talk about a variety of advanced light microscopy techniques. Most of them deal with fluorescently labeled samples. Unfortunately, there's so many techniques, it's going to be just sort of a survey of different advanced techniques. And if you have specific questions, I'll hang around. <coughs> all you. <coughs> all right, so fluorescence microscopy. You take some sort of fluorescent molecule and attach it to a certain portion of your sample that's of interest to you. And you get pretty pictures like this. So this is uh, MDCK cell, uh, Mandan Darby K9 kidney cell, with uh, the DNA stained in blue, the microtubule stained in green, and the mitochondria stained in red. So let's talk about how to get a picture like this to start with. What is fluorescence? So fluorescence, we have a molecule that absorbs light, it absorbs one proton, the proton excites the electron from the ground state to an excited state. The electron then relaxes somewhat to a lower energy level in the excited state. The electron then eventually returns down to the ground state and a photon is emitted. The photon that's emitted is at a longer wavelength, a lower energy, than the photon that was absorbed. <coughs> because they're two different colors now, we put in a blue photon, we've got a green photon. These are easy to separate with filters. And then the electron eventually goes all the way back to its very bottom ground state. So when you're picking dyes, you want to understand the absorption and the emission spectrum. You need to know both, because you need to know what wavelength to excite the dye with and what wavelength to set your filters with to collect the signal. So here are a couple spectra for common dyes. This is Alexa 488. It will absorb light strongly at 488 nanometers, and then it will emit this uh, solid filled region. <coughs> that peak around uh, 5 over 5, 5, 10 nanometers. So this is the shift in colors, and that makes it easy for us to switch, uh, to filter out the excitation light, and just collect the emission light. We can put in different dyes. When we pick different dyes, we want to make sure that the excitation and the emission are separated. So a green and a red are easily separated. <coughs> We separate them with filters. There are, are a couple of different kinds of filters. Just to bring you up to speed on the nomenclature, a short pass filter will pass all wavelengths that are shorter than that number. So this is probably a 450 nanometer short pass filter. So it will pass things that are 450 nanometers and less. A long pass filter is just the opposite. It will pass light that longer in wavelength. So this is a 650 nanometer long pass filter. A band pass filter will pass just a specific band. The nomenclature for a band pass filter is usually uh, the center wavelength and then the absorption of the width, the full width half max. So this is approximately a 550 nanometer filter with a 20 nanometer band pass. And the edge of the filter would probably say 550 slash 20. Which means that light from 540 nanometers to 560 nanometers will be effectively passed by this filter. These filters often go in a filter cube. That's in the filter cube tour we talked about a little bit two weeks ago. Here we have a mercury lamp. It goes to a filter that's the exciter filter. So this will pick out the color that we're going to use to excite the dye. It's reflected off a dichroic mirror. A dichroic means two colors in Greek. It reflects one color and will transmit a different color, basically. So here it will reflect the green light. The green light will go down and excite the specimen. And the red light will be emitted and will come back up through the dichroic mirror, and then the emission filter will clean up 
any light that is left over from the excitation. You can get filter cubes that are just for a single color, and you can get filter cubes that work for three or four colors. The spectra over here on the side are for a filter cube that deals with three different dyes. Here's, uh, I've highlighted the, the Fitzy, so microscopists often use the dyes as just a shortcut nomenclature. Fitzy, GFP, Alexa 48 all have very similar uh, spectral characteristics. And so you'll come up to a microscope and someone will say, this is the GFP filter. And if you really have Alexa 48, you're in good shape and you should go. Here we're exciting the Fitzy uh, Chi at 500. The dichroic here will reflect the light at 500, but transmit the light much longer. And then the emission filter will transmit uh, 510 to 540, something like that. Uh, and this will be our actual system. Let's talk a little bit on how to uh, choose what sort of fluorophore to use for your sample. Uh, sample prep is very important for fluorescence microscopy. You will never get a good image if you have poor sample prep. And full sample prep is its own long lecture by itself. So this will just be a preview. <laughs> Uh, so there's three main types of fluorescent labels. There are now fluorescent proteins that you can have a cell just express um, because you put the DNA to express that protein into the cell. You can have organ organic dyes or you can have organic quantum dyes. So let's talk about each of those. Fluorescent proteins, basically you take a chunk of DNA and you splice it into the cell that you're interested in. It will express the fluorescent protein right after it expresses the protein or structure you're interested in. And so you can label specific structures within your cell with these fluorescent proteins. They're non-toxic. The cell just does it all by itself. Uh, the degree of biochemistry you need to fully understand what's going on is far beyond this talk, so we'll skip that. But know that there are kits. You can just buy a kit. It's got cookbook instructions, quality instructions. You get green glowing uh, cells. The first fluorescent protein was from what's known as GFP, green fluorescent protein. And it comes from a jellyfish that's in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the discovery of GFP uh, was cited for the 2008 Nobel Prize. The jellyfish normally looks like this. But then if you turn out the lights and excite the, the protein, you'll see the protein globalize to this edge of the jellyfish. This fluorescent, green fluorescent protein has been spliced into a wide variety of animals at this point, uh, just about everything except humans. And there's mutations to this protein to give you the full range of the rainbow colors. Everything from blue out to near infrared. The bottom is a picture from the, the Rainbow Project. So that's Jeff Whitman's project where he put in different fluorescent proteins into the mouse brain and then had an enzyme that would randomly cut it. So I put in a red, a green, and a blue protein into each uh, cell. And then the enzyme randomly picked what color it was going to be. And so each neuron in the mouse's brain is a different color now. And you can trace out where each neuron is going. This is an example of how fancy you can get with these fluorescent proteins. So organic dyes came onto the scene about 1942. Uh, fluorescein was the, the first one. It's uh, basically Fitzy, and that's why Fitzy still uh, lurks around as no, in the nomenclature. A note about the naming convention for dyes, the number that's after the dye is the excitation wavelength you should use. So Alexa 4 is a series of dyes uh, that uh, Life Technologies now sells. 
uh, Alexa was the founder's daughter's name, anyway. Uh, but the Alexa 48, you should excite with 48, can be a These organic dyes are fairly small, so it's easy to put them on an antibody. Uh, the antibody protein in immunocytochemistry is, is labeled IgG. It's relatively easy to get these small molecules into cells. On yields, there's the full spectrum of colors. Uh, they do photo bleach, and sometimes they can quench. So other things going on in the cell can sometimes turn off uh, the fluorescence. So quantum dots are small semiconductor crystals. Uh, some things to note about quantum dots is that the excitation spectrum basically the same for all quantum dots. Here's a, a green quantum dot emission and a red quantum dot emission, but you can see they don't have a similar excitation spectra to the, the organic dyes. The organic dyes had a very clear, this is the peak excitation, and we can selectively excite the green dye and selectively excite the red dye. With the quantum dots, we can excite both quantum dots at the same time. We use probably a 400 nanometer laser, and the green quantum dot and the red quantum dot would both be excited and both be on that. This can be good or bad, depending on how you design your experiment. Just be aware that you can't selectively excite the quantum dots. On the other hand, you only need one excitation laser. You turn on the one near UV laser, and all your quantum dots light. The naming convention for the quantum dot then is the, the number after it. So Q dot 605 would mean the emission peak is at 605, not the excitation. So quantum dots, the number is telling you where the emission is, where your signal is. For organic dyes, the number is telling you where the excitation is. Uh, quantum dots don't photo bleach, they're remarkably stable. Uh, they will also show up in electron microscopy, so you can do correlative microscopy look at the cell both in, in light and in an uh, electron microscope. They are nice and bright, high quantum yield. Uh, they're relatively large compared to cells, so if you're trying to get them into cells, sometimes that's a challenge. There are various tricks people have done, uh, so it's certainly possible. They tend to be out of slightly toxic elements to cells. Uh, and they have this very broad excitation spectrum. All right, so how do we set up our microscope to collect the fluorescence image? So we have our excitation light. We send it through the excitation filter. Uh, here in this diagram, the excitation and the emission filter are outside of the filter cube, outside of the physical microscope. That's often done so you can quickly switch between filters and not have to move the entire filter chart. So sometimes the excitation filter, the emission filter, and the dichroic mirror are all in one little filter cube, as I showed in the diagram earlier. Sometimes the excitation and emission filters are outside the microscope filter wheels that allow you to switch. The light, the excitation light then is sent to the sample. Fluorescence is almost always done in what's called heavy illumination, which means that the excitation light and the signal both come from the same side of the sample. If you remember two weeks ago, we were talking about transmitted light microscopy, where the excitation light would come through one side and we collect the signal on the other side. With the flu fluorescence, we want to dump all the excess light that didn't interact with our sample. So all the light that was not absorbed in fluorescing is dumped this way, and this epi illumination cuts down on the background. <coughs> the sample fluoresces, it fluoresces in all directions. We collect a certain small solid angle that depends on the numerical aperture of your objective. The signal passed through the dichroic mirror, often mirrored through the emission filter to your camera. Uh, fluorescence is often done with a mercury or xenon lamp uh, because they have nice bright, uh, bright, wide spectrum. People are often moving to lasers and LEDs. Uh, 
the one catch about lasers and LEDs is you need a different laser or a different LED for each dye you're going to do. So they're a little bit less flexible. <coughs> All right, so white field fluorescence, we can have multiple colors, uh, highlight different structures. The downside is it only works with very flat samples. So these are cells. The projector is not doing a great justice to it, but this part is much more in focus than this part. That's because this part is at a different plane than this part. So unless your sample is really flat, it's hard to get the entire field of view focus. So what do we do about that? How, how do we fix that? Well, one way to fix some of this is with a technique called deconvolution. Deconvolution is basically a mathematical post-processing technique. The light that's coming from above or below your position of sample, the blurred out, the mathematical blurring is called the point spread function. This point spread function can be measured, and then we can remove it from the sample, from the signal in the sample. So the point spread function is what gives us our diffraction limit. We're diffraction limited because of this blurring point spread function. The point spread function will give us approximately half the wavelength of light in x and y, and approximately the wavelength of light um, so for a 532 nanometer laser with a numerical aperture of 1.4 for their objective, we get 200 nanometers in X and Y and 658 nanometers in Z. Mathematically, in real space, the point spread function is said to be involved with your signal. Convolution is sort of a really messy <coughs> thing that you certainly don't want to try to do by hand, or even really with a computer. But if you do a Fourier transform and move from real space to Fourier space, or frequency space, then this interval just becomes multiplication. So it's easy to do a Fourier transform, divide out the point spread function that you measure to the Fourier transform back, and see your image. And here's some examples from commercial software packages that uh, take your image and then you measure the point spread function. You measure the point spread function by taking a sub diffraction limit fluorescent beam. So take a 50 nanometer fluorescent beam, put it on a glass slide, scan and Z going through the focus, and then you'll measure the point spread function. That 50 nanometer bead will be blurred out to about 200 nanometers in X and Y, and 600 nanometers in Z, but you know exactly how much it's blurred out. So then if you know exactly how much each core four is being blurred out, back calculate where each core four really should be. So you can go from a raw image like this to a nice, clean, deep image. Here's just another example, again, with microtubules. Here, the microtubules are a little hard to see. Here, they're very clean. Uh, that's the sort of first approach to dealing with the limitations of uh, white field fluorescence. Another trick we could do is what's called total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. Here, we take the light and have it totally internally reflected off the, the cover glass, and only an evanescent electric field penetrates into our sample. So the electric field of light only penetrates 100, 150 nanometers into the sample. So only the light, only the sample that's 100 nanometers from the cover glass will be excited. So all your signals are coming from a 100 nanometer slice. That 600 nanometers we have in Z is now collapsed to 100 nanometers. We're beating the diffraction limit. The downside is that your sample has to be within 100 nanometers of the cover glass. Uh, so again, here with the, the chirp, we don't gain anything with X and Y, but we gain a lot with Z. We're taking this uh, long point spread function and cutting it down. 
we're cutting it down with the total, uh, total internal reflection. Briefly, to total internal reflection, uh, you may remember from Snell's law. M1 sine of theta 1 equals N2 sine of theta 2. Whenever light goes from glass to air, the light will be kept. We can pick an angle where the light is totally bent back and none of it transmits. This is how a fiber optic works. The fiber optic bounces the light back and forth between the glass and the polymer coating. Uh, so it will always transmit and never come out until you reach the end of the glass. Magnetic and electric fields can't be discontinuous. Uh, so at this interface, what's said to be, what's called an evanescent electric field penetrates into the sample. If it cut off immediately, it would be discontinuous here because it would be zero, the electric field would be zero and some finite value. So this exponential decay of the evanescent field satisfies Maxwell's wave equations. And this electric field can be still used to excite the floor force in the sample. The first way people set up turf microscopy was to have a prism sitting on top of our sample. We bring in a laser to internally reflect it, but the thrust is going down. Uh, the problem with this setup is that then you have a laser beam usually sending around, wandering around the lab at eye level, which is bad. So most people now do this through the objective technique, where you come up one side of the objective, reflect off the cover glass, and then the excitation light is dumped down the other side and blocked down here somewhere inside the microscope. And the fluorescence is collected straight down the middle of the microscope. So turf allows you to have really low background images uh, down to single molecule detection. Here's some literature images showing you wide field fluorescence and turf. So these structures are on the cover glass, and all this other stuff is above the cover glass. So here's a movie of single molecules walking along. So, wow, this projector's not doing it. Uh, there are small gray dots walking along here. Those dots are single quantum dots that are attached to a little molecular motor called uh, dining. The dining basically walks along the microtubule. The microtubule is unlabeled in this experiment. Basically, the dining is one of the molecular motors that transports things from the outside of the cell along the microtubules to the inside of the cell. So, and this uh, in vitro uh, experiment, the dynein is transporting a quantum dot along the microtubule. <coughs> uh, there are a lot of quantum dots that are floating around in solution, and only the quantum dots that come down and are walking along the tubule are collected here. All the other ones that are floating around in solution in the background are not excited because of this total internal reflection. All right, so that's one trick for doing better than the diffraction limit you can see. What about XY? What can we do in XY to get around the diffraction? So two very similar techniques uh, called storm and palm. Uh, stochastic optical diffraction microscopy and photoactivated localization microscopy. I uh, have been working on this. The idea is basically we prepare the sample so the floor floor swing on and off, so one at a time. We again know that the diffraction limit will blur it out to 200 nanometers, something like that. But we know that this blurring function is a Gaussian function, so we can fit it. We can say, I know the floor floor should be at the middle of this blur, so we'll fit the, the Gaussian and then just put a, a dot at the middle of that blur. And we'll do this each time and build up an image. So GFP is a, is a fluorescent protein. It's about four nanometers uh, long and three, two and a half nanometers in diameter. 
it's going to, a single GFP is going to give us a 200 nanometer spot. But we know mathematically what this blurring function is, and so we can fit this blurring function and localize, know exactly where that GFP is actually sitting. The problem is that we can only do it one fluorophore at a time. We need this to be a single fluorophore being excited to be able to do this with. Uh, this is just, again, say, here's what the single floor floor is going to look like in X and Y and in Z. We do a Gaussian fit, and then we put a dot at the, at the middle of the Gaussian fit. So here is a cartoon of some solution. <laughs> we prepare the, the sample such that only one floor floor is on at a time. We do the fit. We put a dot there. Prepare the samples so that another fluorophore is on. We do a fit, a dot pair, and we can build up an image over time like this. So a storm data set has 40,000, 50,000, 70,000 images in the data set. You end up with 30 or 40 gigabytes of data because you have to only have a couple fluorophores on it in each frame. But the results are really impressive. So we go from Images like this, uh, down to we can reconstruct where all the four floors were uh, and get about 20 nanometer localization. We can know with an accuracy of about 20 nanometers the four floor was right here. This is often done in turf mode to get rid of some of the background again. If you're, you can get your sample set up so that the structure of interest is right by the Cover so here's just a huge example that I think helps illustrate things a little better. Uh, so once an hour, the, the light on the Eiffel Tower. Okay. Just have a quick uh, question. Uh, how many pixels across is the uh, Gaussian spot to store? Uh, like, so, so in diameter, it's probably three pixels, so you end up with like nine pixels uh, for your fit. So, if it, so does it work if you were kind of these pixels that are too large, like if you have a spot that's like two pixels across, would it work if you don't get it? If you ended up in that situation, I'd try to adjust your magnification such that your light was spread over more pixels because you get a better fit. All right, so once an hour, the Eiffel Tower lights are set to blink. So here we have a beautiful example where we have blinking chlorophores. The light bulbs at this point, but that's okay. So the light bulbs blink over here. Here we're doing the localization, and over here we're localizing where each light bulb is. All right, so here we have a very accurate idea of where each light bulb is on the Eiffel Tower that we can never get from the image with all the light bulbs on it at the same time. A, taking a storm data set basically is the same, except you're looking at something that's not the Eiffel Tower, you're looking at something very small. Just to make uh, a quick point that storm is not exclusively limited to biology. Uh, here's an example of look, uh, looking at a polymer blend. They, this is a polystyrene polymethylmethacrylate blend. The polymethylmethacrylate has been fluorescently labeled. So the storm image is here, and uh, this figure is comparing the storm image to the AFM image. A variable angle fluorescence image and an SEM image. 
all of the scale bars are one micron. So the storm is directly comparable to the AFM and the SEM. The, in the SEM, what we're seeing is the PMMA has been selectively dissolved. So we're seeing the voids left by the PMMA. In the AFM, the PMMA is sitting up a little bit in the blend, so it ends up being bright in the polystyrene part. But these all show your, your the nano domains of the polymer mix. Um, and there may be situations where you want to do it for us. All right, so what are some other tricks we can do to get better images in the way that we use? So confocal microscopy is a fairly common trick. Here we spatially filter the collected light and reject the light that's coming from above or below the sample plane of interest. And then we can move the objective and change the sample plane of interest and build up a three-dimensional reconstruction. There are two types of confocal microscopes. One is called a laser scanning confocal and one is called a spinning disc confocal. In a laser scanning confocal microscope, we have a set of scanning mirrors. So here's the two mirrors. One scans the laser beam in X, and one scans the laser beam in Y. We raster scan the laser across the sample. And then we're still exciting light through this whole, we're still exciting floor force through this whole dimension. But the, the signal that's collected comes back, and there's a pinhole that rejects the light from above and below the plane of interest. So below the plane of interest will focus to a slightly different spot. Above the plane of interest will focus to a slightly different spot. And these can be spatially filtered out with a pinhole. So only light from the plane that we're interested in will make it to our detector, which is typically a photomultiplier. What is this scanning? <coughs> The, the scanning unit here is this set of mirrors, uh, basically. So it's a set of mirrors that move in X and Y. Uh, these mirrors really sit here in the scan. Is it corresponding to the middle mirror? Yes. So the, these two metal mirrors sit here in what's labeled the scan unit and move the laser being in X and Y across your sample. And a spinning disk on focal microscope, instead of having a single point that we move across our sample, we have a thousand points uh, that we move across our sample. And we do that by having a disk with a thousand points. The light comes in, there's a micro lens array to focus it down to a whole series of pinholes. The light then is sent down to your sample. And so we're illuminating a whole area. We're illuminating a number of spots. We keep track of the spots. The uh, light comes back through the disk and then it's sent to a CCD camera. And then the CCD camera will build up an image of the sample as the disk spins. So the advantage of the spinning disk is that you're doing a thousand points at a time, so it's much faster. The downside is that pinholes are fixed. You get one disk, that, that's what you're set with. Whereas with the laser scanning system, uh, this pinhole is adjustable. So you, by adjusting the width of the pinhole, you can adjust how thick a z-slice you're taking. So a smaller pinhole will give you a thinner z-slice. So uh, confocal microscopy, again, gives you a very low background because we're only looking at a single z-plane at a time. You end up with something where everything is in focus and you can do a 3D reconstruction. So this is <coughs> some cotton fibers that are fluorescently dyed uh, and done a 3D reconstruction of them. 
don't have to do confocal with the license. You can do it just with the reflected light. Uh, you can use the pinhole to eject the light that's reflected um, from above or below the plane of interest. Uh, so here is some silicon through gears. You can take the, this is the XY image, and this is the Z slice across the gears, so you can measure the depth of the through gears. Fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, commonly known as FRAP, is a way to look at the repopulation of a photo bleached zone uh, and study molecular dynamics. This is often done with a confocal microscope. So basically, we're going to come into this cell and we're going to photo bleach. So, photo bleach means we destroy the fluorescent molecules by shining too much light on it. And then we're going to watch the, the fluorescence come back, and that tells us about the turnover dynamics of the fluorescent protein in the, in the cell. So uh, one of the regions is right here. If you watch that region, uh, you'll see it gets dark, and then it starts coming back. And we can measure how fast it comes back, and then study the kinetics of, of uh, system. Right. So one more time, just watch right here. It goes dark fairly quickly. Oops. There it went dark, and now it's uh, recovering. And you typically report the half-life of the fluorescence, fluorescence recovery. Uh, how long did it come, take to get back to 50% of the fluorescence? It's never going to get back to 100% of the reflected uh, fluorescence. So it starts, here's normalized at 1. You would report the time it took to get back to 50% because it will never quite get back to 1. All right, so now that we have uh, these scanning mirrors and we can scan the laser around our sample, what else can we do with that? We can do a, a couple techniques called two photon fluorescence and second harmonic generation. They use the same set of scanning mirrors, but they use a much more powerful laser. So we use what's called a femtosecond laser. Uh, it has very short, very strong pulses. Uh, typically, uh, it's in the near infrared, so we'll shine in two photons in the near infrared, and the two photons. And they're simultaneously absorbed by a molecule, will excite the electron to an excited state, and relax and give us our normal fluorescence. <coughs> the advantage of the two photon is that only at the focal volume is the electric field high enough to give us fluorescence. So on the bottom here is our single photon fluorescence. On the top here is the two photon fluorescence. You can see we're only generating light at that small dot. So we don't need the pinhole anymore. We only generate light from the clean C section. Second harmonic generation is very similar to two photon fluorescence. The difference is that the emission is exactly twice the excitation. There's no non-radiative decay step. Second harmonic generation works on structural elements. Certain structures in a sample will give you second harmonic generation. Here we're looking at collagen from a mouse. A lot of semiconductors will give you second harmonic generation. So I've done second harmonic generation of germanium nanowires. And we've got a movie of the forest of germanium nanowires. I didn't stick it in this presentation. Uh, but it's not limited to uh, biological samples. Second harmonic generation, a lot, a lot of inorganic samples will give you second harmonic generation too, and you can do 3D structures of it. So the, the nice part about two photon fluorescence and second harmonic generation is that you set up your microscope, and as long as you have two detectors, you can have both 
for the price of one, or you can simply have two filters and one detector. Um, you basically get the two proton fluorescence and the second harmonic generation at the same time. Um, so here are so, some uh, white blood cells on the that have been labeled with GFP and they're sitting on the collagen network. Another super resolution technique is called stimulated emission depletion microscopy. Again, we're scanning our laser across the sample. The uh, trick here is that we have two laser beams. One laser beam is shaped like a donut, and one laser beam is your normal circular laser beam. We'll excite the fluorophore, and then we'll de-excite fluorophores in the shape of a donut, and then only a very small area of the middle will actually be our So we have our excitation beam and our stead beam. We excite this spot with our excitation beam as we work with normal fluorescence. We bring in our, our stead spot and we de-excite everything in this donut shape. So this excitation spot will diffraction limited. We can't get that spot less than 200 hectares. But we can de-excite the fluorophores around the edge of that spot and leave just, in this case, a 66 nanometer spot that gives us signal. Uh, and then we collect the light from that 66 nanometer spot and use our scanning mirrors in the front of the microscope to move on to the next spot. So Seven Hell uh, developed this. Uh, this was actually the first super resolution microscopy technique. He developed it uh, in the late 90s. And then he's done a lot of work uh, on neurons, actually. So here's a confocal image of the neuron. And then here's the stem image. You can see these uh, fluorescently labeled structures are much smaller than what we perceive in the confocal image. Another super resolution trick that can be done is called structured illumination microscopy. So here we use what are called Moriarty fringes. Sometimes you see them in kids' optical illusion books. Uh, the idea is that we interfere light with a known spatial frequency with the light from the sample. Then we move to Fourier space and calculate the sample's spatial frequency. So I mentioned two weeks ago, the image is formed uh, by the diffraction of light interfering. This is Abe's theory of image formation. Here's our point spread function. The more orders of light we collect with our microscope lens, the more information, we, the more spatial information we have. So Mori patterns briefly, here's one series of lines so we have a periodic structure in our sample. We can move this pattern of light over it. Now we've taken our sample and it's interfering with the pattern of light. And you can see that these are much larger bars. So we've taken something that might be below uh, our resolution limit and moved it into a spatial frequency that's above our, our uh, resolution limit. So since we know what pattern of light we put on the sample, we can back calculate what our sample actually was. Uh, this is just showing a, an optical image and then what it looks like in frequency space. Higher frequencies are at the edge the higher frequencies correspond to smaller structures. So we want to try to extend the area and frequency space that we are actually collecting with our lens. And we do that by interfering it with a known pattern, which the interference moves the spatial frequency back into the region we can collect with our lens. 
So K space is this frequency space. We have our pattern. We rotate the pattern to collect the interference in all directions. So we end up needing to take nine images uh, with this pattern. And this mathematically projects the higher frequencies, which is, uh, the higher frequencies that we can't detect back into the, the region that we can't detect. So here's an example with a cluster of fluorescent beads. The first one is your conventional wide field. The next one is confocal. And the last one is our structured illumination. Structured illumination will get you down to about 100 nanometers in resolution. Uh, here's a more exciting sample where we're going uh, with the active filaments in the HeLa cell from white field fluorescence to structural illumination. So as I said, structural illumination gives us about a factor of two in XY resolution. Uh, so we're down to around 100 nanometers. You use your normal fluorescent sample prep if you don't need anything special. Uh, you do need to do some special uh, reconstruction to your sample and uh, illuminate it with this fringe pattern. The last topic I'm going to touch on in terms of advanced uh, fluorescent microscopy is what's known as force to resonance energy transfer. So this is often referred to as your nanoscale ruler. If you have two fluorescent molecules that are within 10, 10 nanometers of each other, and the dipoles are aligned and the fluorescence spectra overlap properly, you can tell specifically if they're five nanometers or six nanometers or seven nanometers apart. So this is often used when you have a structure in your cell and you want to see if it closes, opens. Uh, so you'll label the two ends and then when it, the structure closes, you'll get this fret. So you need two dyes that are called a fret pair. You have what's called a donor and what's called an acceptor fluorophore. You will excite the donor fluorophore with your uh, light, but then you'll look for the acceptor fluorophore signal. Uh, so in picking fret pairs, you need to actually have an overlap in the spectrum. Uh, cerulean fluorescent protein and yellow fluorescent protein are a popular set of pairs. The energy, one, one important thing to note is that the energy transfer is actually not radiated. So here's our donor fluorophore. We bring in a photon, we excite the electron, it relaxes, and then it transfers its energy to the excited fluorophore to go back rather than emit a photon. So the donor is not emitting a photon, and the acceptor is absorbing the photon. There's no photon in this intermediate step. This energy transfer will excite an electron from the ground state to the excited state, which will go through its own non-radiative energy transfer, and then our emission here uh, is the acceptor for its emission. So often people do what's called ratiometric thread. They look very carefully at the ratio of the intensities uh, from samples with donor acceptor pairs and with the control of the donor alone and with the acceptor alone. There's a number of ways you can get tripped up doing this. Your sample prep has to be exactly the same, your labeling has to be exactly the same, or else you'll get different intensities. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to get tripped up. Except your photo bleaching is a little cleaner. Um, uh, way to do it. Spectral fret's another way to do it. Sort of the cleanest way I've seen to do fret, if you really are interested in fret, is to do what's called fret flim, so fluorescence lifetime imaging. 
the, if you have this energy transfer, how long the fluorophore stays excited will change. And you can measure this lifetime, uh, which is intrinsic to the molecule. The change in the lifetime is intrinsic to the molecule, and it's not dependent on your optical setup or your labeling or whatnot. So that's probably the cleanest way to do it. Now, I'm happy to entertain any questions.